CGTN, China Global Television Network. The problem of youth unemployment in Africa is one that has been described as a ticking time bomb. It undermines the potential and energy of youth, leaving many of them idle, vulnerable and susceptible to vices such as crime and drugs. 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 35 and, according to the African Development Bank, the problem is not just unemployment but underemployment as well. So, with a burgeoning population that is not matched by job market growth, how can the problem of youth unemployment be addressed? This week on the program, we take a closer look at this crisis and some options for Africa's youth. I'm Penina Karibe. Welcome to Talk Africa. According to the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Africa's population is projected to grow to over 1.6 billion people by the year 2030. The continent will also have the highest youth growth rate in the world. Youth in Africa account for 60% of all of the continent's jobless and the rising population adds to the complexity of the problem. On average, 11 million young people join the African labor market each year, yet the continent generates only 3.7 million jobs annually. So this forces many job seekers into the informal sector and, as a result, many youth lack access to job security, social safety nets or any form of workers' rights. The frustration of an unemployed young population can, in its extreme, have severe consequences. The World Bank estimates that 40% of people who join rebel movements are motivated by a lack of economic opportunity. The situation is also complex for young girls who may face a multitude of challenges, including a lack of access to reproductive health services, education and employment opportunities. The United Nations Development Program estimates that $95 billion of revenue is lost annually due to gender inequalities in Africa. Joining me now to take a closer look at the growing problem of youth and employment in Africa are from Zanzibar, Anthony Mbeyange, Executive Director, the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research. From Cape Town, we have Leonard Mbule Nziege, Political Analyst and Economist. And from Abuja, Nigeria, we have Angela Omoru. She is the COO, Jealous Development Initiatives. Welcome everyone to the program. Dr. Mbeyange, I'll begin with you. The African Development Bank reports that while 10 million to 12 million youth enter the workforce in Africa each year, only 3 million formal jobs are created annually. Why are there no jobs in the continent? That's a million, that's a million dollar question, why are there are no jobs in the continent. But I think there are, several, there are several reasons why there are no jobs. First, the structure of our economies. So uh, African economies are largely agricultural, you know, we tend to argue agriculture is the backbone of our economies. They're not diversified. And I think that also um, explains why there are no jobs. Uh, most of the uh, sectors that you would wish to see uh, generating uh, decent jobs are not actually well uh, optimal in the way that one would see in the other regions in the world. Uh, we are seeing a uh, service sector is coming up now, but not to the level where we want it to be, manufacturing sector. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, police uh, cry out on industrialization and the structural transformation in the continent. So uh, for those reasons, we don't see so much jobs uh, in terms of what can absorb the uh, youth bulge that uh, you talked about. Right. So Leonard, out of the 10 to 12 million youth who enter the workforce every year, where do the other seven to nine million who miss out on jobs go? Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Dr. Anthony spoke about, uh, spoke to, the economic structure of our economies um, is somewhat outdated and it doesn't help with respect to the job, um, the access to jobs. And what happens to a lot of these youths who can't gain access to formal employment is that they get um, absorbed into the informal economy. And, you know, these are low paying jobs with um, little security, very minimal social protection in domains such as transport. Um, in West and East Africa, the, um, the, the being a motor motorcycle rider is quite popular. Um, small scale retail, 
um, telecommunications now. A lot of people get into, you know, um, selling on mobile phones or selling mobile credit. So um, you have a lot of small scale jobs, but then now, like I said, they're in the informal sector and they don't provide a lot of security. And yeah, for example, in my home country, Cameroon, where 90% of um, employed individuals find themselves in the informal sector. So it is a very, very deep seated problem. Right. And Angela coming to you, just listening to what Leonard is talking about, you find that a lot of these people yeah. who go to the informal sectors are people who are graduates, uh, you know, in, in fields such as engineering, for instance, medicine. But there's also the argument that African societies have for a long time valued a few professional fields to the ex exclusion of many others and have therefore not created ample jobs mm -hmm. in less popular fields. And we're talking about, you know, creative fields, for instance, things like writing, like music, like art. So those are dismissed as hobbies. Is there a need for a mind shift in Africa? Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I completely believe that that's the trajectory that we should be looking at right now, a complete mind shift, because we have more and more young people that are becoming more creative. So you have more writers. I mean, but um, a mind shift really has to happen for the way, with the way that we are parenting these days, being able to explore um, other opportunities, being able to see that in as much as they are not the regular decent jobs that we have or that we've grown up to know but the question should be what even defines a decent job what defines what is should be formal and what should be informal in that regard because um what's very important is is the work honest is this person making an honest living so really um from talking about parenting and the way the educational system is also structured there's so many changes that really do have to happen to be able to uh you know, usher more young people into what we call the future of work these days. How can we make people uh, realize that, yes, even if you're a creative, you're a writer, you're a singer, you're a digital content creator or any sort, how can you still take that same resource into what is termed the more formal sector? So, yes, there is definitely a need for a mind shift from the way we parent and the way our educational system is structured currently. All right. Talk to us about the challenges that you've seen young people go through as they seek to as they seek to create jobs because you work in an organization that was started by one such person who decided i am not going to seek employment instead i am going to create the employment myself okay um that's a very valid question because as someone who works with a lot of young people one thing that i see happen a lot of times is what being unable to secure enough funding to to scale up the business so first of all um let me take this this example from the sector I'm, I'm involved in, which is the nonprofit sector. As someone who's in the nonprofit sector, a lot of times there's an issue of scaling up the ideas that you have. There's also the issue of being able to get some costs that your organization, like administrative costs that you have. So more often than not, funding is a huge problem for most entrepreneurs. Then there's also the issue of creating structure. Yes, we have more digital tools these days, um, tools that are designed to help you be able to sort out your HR system, your financials. But then well, the question is how much digital literacy is out there to be able to use the tools that have been created for uh, young entrepreneurs. Of course, there's also the issue of other barriers like uh, in Nigeria, there's the issue of um, stable power supply. These are change challenges that we see day in, day out. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if suddenly the power is just cut off right now because this is the reality that we have that we're living with there's also the issue of okay if it's not electricity then the issue of internet access um high cost of data access internet access is a daily problem that i see a lot of young entrepreneurs battling day in day out right and i, I think just listening to you of course the problems are, are just quite many for anybody thinking of starting out so dr mviange how does one create their own opportunities and even where do you begin <laughs> i think i think i think first is being creative and i like what angela said do you yeah. have what it takes to do can you take are you a risk taker i think that's very important it is starts um, from you it is starts within the young people to believe in themselves number one to uh, live their dreams and pursue what is it that they want to achieve in life that's very important i think but also a, 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 at a family level, at a community level, at the society level, more broadly at the country level, do we have systems and ecosystem that supports young people who dream? That's very important mm. because 
there are dreams that are shattered just because every time somebody says something, they are they are sort of being told this is impossible. This is, I think we need to create a culture and mindset shift in encouraging young people to dream and to try. And when they fail, we need to be able to mentor them and, and, and tell them failing is okay, it's part of learning. And what are they learning out of that process? I think this is very important uh, uh, for young people who are aspiring to do more. Digital space, as Angela articulated, is, is very lucrative. It, it is open to, for everyone who has the right mindset, uh, the right skills. Can they teach themselves? How much time do they spend in, in such spaces to trying to identify opportunities? There are quite a lot. So it, it, I, I would say opportunities are immense. Opportunities are many. Uh, it's upon one to see them and go after them. All right, so, so Leonard, let's pick it up from there. Opportunities are many, says uh, Dr. Mbeyange. It's upon somebody to seize them. But then somebody would ask, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I don't have an idea. So we're here talking about entrepreneurship, Leonard. How do we promote the idea of entrepreneurship as opposed to seeking formal employment? I mean, one of the areas that you talked about was the creative space. The purple economy has really opened up um, a lot of um, opportunities which we didn't even think were imaginable. I mean, talking about Angela's home country in Nigeria, Nollywood now is estimated uh, has an estimated yeah. value of $1 billion, and it creates 1 million uh -huh. direct jobs, which is the second highest um, right. sectoral contributor to employment in Nigeria after agriculture. And this is a sector which is less than 30 years old. So you can imagine that yeah. this is something, this is, an, this is an industry which emerged out of someone's creativity, and as a result, it has evolved from strength to strength. You also have the music industry when you're looking at the purple economy. Um, in West African Afrobeats, we've seen that it's one of the fastest growing genres mm -hmm. of music across the world. And that has created um, opportunities across the board, whether it's for artists, whether it's for events makers, all across the board. Here in South Africa, you have Amapiano as well. That's creating a lot of employment. It's creating a lot of opportunities. So I think we need to think out of the box with respect to uh, what has been told to us um, in terms of what are the opportunities or what we can pursue with respect to employment opportunities because in the past we've just been told even up to now we're still told to be engineers lawyers doctors and so on and so forth but then you look at our counterparts overseas in the u.s and in europe they're told that you know you look at an opportunity or you see that there's um, a gap and you try to fill it and a lot of the jobs which are being um you know pursued today five to ten years ago they weren't and as anthony has said you know there is in the digital space the digital space almost on a daily basis is creating new jobs telecoms as well so i think that you know it's just a matter of thinking out of the box um not necessarily ascribing to what has been told to us in the past and just being able to see what are the gaps and how they can be filled and as a result creating more job opportunities all right so let me just ask you this leonard because we're talking about uh, of course things like digital space and I remember Angela talking to us about some of the infrastructural challenges, especially in Nigeria. She talked about power cuts, for instance, uh, and even high internet cost. So somebody who lives in rural Africa, you know, in whatever part of Africa it could be, whatever country of Africa it could be, would be wondering, how can I access these things that I'm hearing? You know, internet, for instance, electricity. Many other parts of rural Africa don't even have, have access to such places. Angela is talking about Nigeria, and she is in a commercial setup or urban setup of Nigeria. But how about those who are in rural Africa? How do they seize these opportunities? I mean, it's very telling because I'm in South Africa, and for the past few years, we've been having a, what we call load shedding, rolling blackouts, and you know we have the different stages, and it's very been and it's been very debilitating. It's um, hampered business activity. Some businesses have had to close. It's been very, very disruptive. So it's a reality. Um, but what needs to happen is that um, governments need to do their utmost to be able to put in place the infrastructure because I believe that um, governments shouldn't necessarily play a full-on interventionist role with respect to um, structuring the economy, but then they need to put in place the conditions in order for um, entrepreneurship, for the private sector to, um, to be able to play its role That's as right. the main job creator. And in that regard, they need to work hand in hand with the private sector because a lot of these private sector actors, they do want to you know, get involved in semi-urban and rural um, localities because that's where there's a very great market potential. However, mm -hmm. if the government isn't showing some sort of political will in order to put in place a necessary infrastructure, I mean, it's as basic as ensuring that the lights are on for at least a certain amount of time and then also having access to broadband, you know, or even just ensuring that 
um, you know, internet costs or access to data is affordable. Those are things which the government needs to work alongside with the private sector and even the civil society in order to ensure that those um, the necessary conditions are in place for jobs to be created for people who live in semi-urban as well as rural localities. All right. So we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on some options the growing youth population may use to secure financial stability. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me are Angela Omuru, Anthony Mbeyange, and Leonard Mbule Nzi again. Before the break, we looked at the scope of the youth unemployment crisis in Africa. Let's now look at some avenues the youth may have to generate income. Uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Mbeyange. Which sectors in Africa are the most lucrative? I mean, you're in Zanzibar, and just taking you back about um, maybe a decade, maybe 15 years back, here in Kenya, for instance, bongo music, which you're very familiar with, that's music from Tanzania especially, was such a huge, 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 you know, I would, I'd call it, it was, it was like a hit, like the in thing here. But I feel like even then, Afrobeat as we know them now were not as popular as they've now become. And so the question is, even as we talk about the sectors in Africa that are most lucrative, how do young people identify these opportunities long before everybody else jumps in the same bandwagon? Okay, thank you very much. Let me talk a little bit about the research that my organization has done in Africa on agriculture, particularly in agribusiness. So by and large, agriculture is still the most lucrative sector that can actually transform the continent in terms of creating meaningful and decent jobs for young people in the continent. Uh, uh, and, and it is an area that uh, uh, I don't think it requires too much reckoning because we are very blessed in many ways as a continent. I think what we need is, as what Leonard was saying, can we address structural challenges that the agricultural sector is facing? And how do we do that? How can government bring in different players, civil society, private sector, you know, even development partners to see how we can transform the agricultural sector to bring majority of our young people, because majority of Africans are in rural areas, and these Africans are most of them young people, and this is where we can have a huge impact. But I think also, if you reflect also on urban areas, digital space and fourth industrial revolution, what uh, Angela was discussing about is also very lucrative. It's also very important. It's an area that uh, digital skills, digital transformation that we see a lot of youth in TikTok, Instagram, a lot of young people are selling stuff online to sustain themselves. So these are areas that also uh, young people can be creative. That time they spend on chatting and, and doing funny things on Instagram and TikTok can be diverted to thinking productively and creatively in terms of creating opportunities for themselves. They just have to be open to them. Uh, there are other sectors where uh, they are also coming up. Uh, uh, IT service sectors are also becoming quite lucrative. These are areas that uh, young people with the right mindset, with the right skills and capacitation can actually do wonders in the continent. Right. So, Leonard, Angela earlier on talked about funding as one of the main problems for many, many startups. How can they cut through the red tape and access affordable finance? I mean, there is finance, but then we're talking also about affordable finance. Yeah, finance, access to finance, whether it's big business or if you're a micro entrepreneur, um, is always been a very, very big challenge uh, with respect to carrying out business. And I think that we need to find innovative solutions because it's been classic, the classic um, uh, mechanisms or the classic way of trying to pursue uh, having access to finances, going to a commercial bank, looking for a loan. But the thing is, the banks, especially with the ones which operate across the continent, they are very, very conservative in the way that they do, they carry out their lending. You know the areas in which they're going to, you know, uh, the domains where they're going to allocate um, finances towards. It's going to be energy, telecoms, mining, retail. 
agribusiness. It's going to be very difficult for startups, for example, in the um, in the telecoms and digital space, or as well as creatives, uh, to be able to raise money, despite the fact that we know that they have significant potential. And these are the domains which absorb a lot of young people. I think new mechanisms such as crowdfunding, um, looking towards microfinance, um, governments also are going to have to come to the table because, um, as I said, they're supposed to pal they need to palliate where the fi private sector isn't necessarily coming um, to the table. Um, it's not very easy, but then also development partners as well, because in some instances, they have been the catalyst towards, you know, ensuring that these um, domains which haven't gotten as much attention from classic uh, um, banking and commercial financing institutions have not given to um, nascent domains. But I think that if we take that approach of, like I said, not only looking towards um, commercial banks and classic um, financial institutions, that could help us um, to be able to break um, that mode of not being able to have access to finance. Right, and Angela, following up on what Leonard is talking about, can we make it obligatory for financiers to fund startups? Well, um, on one hand, yes, you could you could decide to um, do that kind of um, create that kind of policy. But there's something that Leonard mentioned earlier, which is the fact that the government cannot or is not advised to take a hundred percent active role in creating or in economic transformations like this. So, if it's if policies can be created to that effect to make sure that time to certain financial institutions can provide some level of funding. The, the balance has to be straddled very, very um, delicately so that the government is not coming in and monopolizing and um, trying to take over the entire thing and creating uh, an economy that's completely dependent on the government. So it's about being able to even give the financial institutions enough reason to, to um, invest in providing funding for businesses in this way. So, so that in the end, it's a give and take situation and not just policies mandating financial institutions in that respect. All right. So, Dr. Mbeyange, according to a Brookings Institution report, just a small number of young entrepreneurs in sub-Saharan Africa find success, and they're rarely able to subsequently hire fellow young Africans. So the question is, how do you nurture a startup that is strong, that is that starts small, and then grows and is able to create more and more jobs? I think number one is mentorship. Mentorship is key. They need support, they need mentorship, they need training to understand how to sustain their businesses and how then, uh, what kind of model would work for them in terms of also creating job for the other young people. But I think the other thing that is very important is uh, um, conducive environment. Policy environment in most of African countries are very punitive for these young mm. startups to the extent that sometimes they struggle uh, to hire people. So if government could leverage in creating an environment where uh, policies are incentivizing young people to go into different sectors so that they're able not only to employ themselves but to create jobs for the other people. The, 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 the third point that I, um, I want to echo what my uh, uh, Leonard and Angela have talked about funding. And one thing that, uh, for example, in Kenya, most of the uh, commercial banks, they do business with, with government. So if a commercial bank is doing business with governments, buying treasure bills, treasure bonds, yeah, which are very lucrative, when do you think they'll spend time giving money to the young people and the startups to be able to sustain themselves, one, but also to be able to, to, to reuse that, that capital for uh, generating more employment for the other young people? So I think access to capital needs to be looked upon. Policy frameworks need to be looked upon. And I want to say that uh, uh, if need be, then governments need to actually put affirmative action that commercial banks a portion of the funding that commercial banks that are raising or their liquidity needs to be directed to private sectors that would help create jobs for the young people in Africa. Well, it's interesting you say that, uh, Dr. Mbuyang, and I'll throw this question to Leonard. So Dr. Mbuyang is talking about um, affirmative action, and I'll give an example of where I am here in Kenya. There is certain efforts, several efforts, government of Kenya has actually put in place to try and incorporate women, for instance, and the youth. And so you'll have... Um, a law, for instance, that says that you have to give a certain percentage to the women or the youth. And we have something that is called the Youth Enterprise Fund here in Kenya. But then I want to know, Leonard, from you, have such government efforts um, elsewhere, not just here in Kenya, but according to your research, do you think they've borne fruit? Have they achieved what government intended for these efforts to achieve? Well, we have a, the textbook case in South Africa. As you know, you had um, apartheid, which was in place and gave uh, 
uh, whites a disproportionate advantage over the rest of society, um, over 90% of uh, people of color in society. And 1994, when apartheid was ended, you had the Black Economic Empowerment Scheme, which was put in place, which um, basically legislated for um, people who had uh, uh, Blacks, colors, and Asians, people who had been um, discriminated under apartheid, to have preferential access to business opportunities, contracts, shares, and so on and so forth. But then in as much as it's helped to, you know, create a black middle and upper middle class, as well as upper class individuals, including the president, the current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, it hasn't had a broad based effect. And in many respects, people believe that it has facilitated corruption because a lot of those opportunities are provided to people who are close to ruling parties who have inroads in government. Um, in as much as I believe in, um, you know, affirmative, react in, um, affirmative action and positive discrimination, it's not the magic wand to be able to create employment opportunities for, you know, um, historically disadvantaged or um, groups who, or groups who haven't had as much opportunity as, um, you know, previously privileged ones. So in my opinion, I believe that what needs to be done is that we need to, or governments as well as the private sector, they need to maximize on the domains which are already producing a lot of uh, revenue. Uh, the Africa report says that the five um, highest generating domains on the African continent are energy, telecoms, mining, retail, and agribusiness. If you look at those domains, in most instances, there's not a lot of value add which has been pursued in, domain, in these domains at present. But I believe that if we do pursue um, such efforts, that, they, that will go a wrong way in order to you know, help women and young people to be able to have more job and revenue um, generating opportunities. All right. So obviously what's coming out of this conversation is that governments are central in creating jobs. So Angela, what policies, because this is something that has come up in this conversation, what policies are needed to spur and not just spur, but also support job creation? And we're talking about decent jobs. I think at the heart of that question is supporting homegrown initiatives. So in Nigeria, we have certain brands that have uh, broken into the automobile sector. We have brands that have really broken into the financial uh, digital services. But now the question is, how much support have they gotten from the government to um, drive uh, uh, patronage? Because more often than not, we still have monopoly. Um, in, um, there is no monopoly of sorts. Now, this is not monopoly to shut off other competitors, but then prioritizing homegrown support, um, homegrown solutions, so that in that way, there is more employment within the country as against allowing competitors from outside the country just coming. And while it's good to support um, a more equal um, economy, it's also not good because sometimes the homegrown solutions do not have the scale or the resources to compete on the same level. So what uh, policies, the policies that we should be looking at are policies that governments can give to these homegrown solutions to ensure that they have equal footing with international um, solution providers. All right. So, well, thank you very much for these perspectives. Uh, we have to leave it here uh, for now, I'm afraid. Very interesting conversation. Wish we had more time, but that's all for this edition of Talk Africa. A very big thank you to all of our guests, Angela Umoru, COO, Jealous Development Initiatives. We had Anthony Mbeyange, Executive Director, the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research, and also Leonard Mbule Nziege, a political analyst and economist. And remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. You can also catch the show on our YouTube playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Penina Karibe, and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, it's goodbye.